I'll call the meeting to order of the Senate State Government Finance and Policy and Elections Committee. Uh, glad to have you all with us today. We actually have a rather full agenda, so we're going to try and uh, keep it moving as well here. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with the roll call. Uh, Ms. Wilson. Senator Kiffmeyer. Present. Senator Howe. Present. Senator Carlson. Senator Clausen. Present. Senator Fateh. Senator Curran. Present. Senator Pratt. Present. Senator Osmick. Senator Carlson. Senator Fateh. Senator Osmick. A quorum is present. Quorum is present. Thank you, members, very much. Um, I appreciate that. And so our first item on the agenda today is Senate File 4508. Senator Rarick, welcome to the committee. You can go ahead and, as usual, state your name and title for the audio record, then proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Jason Rarick. Um, and we do have a technical Can you amendment. lean into your oh. microphone? Those are okay. so Sorry. tough. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, Senator Jason Rarick, and uh, we have Senate File 4508. And Madam Chair, do you wish to do the technical author's amendment first? I will, uh, Senator Rarick. So I will offer the A1 amendment to Senate File 4508. And members, this is a uh, first time hearing, but it is a technical amendment. Uh, just a few language changes, nothing substantive. Does everyone have it? All good to go? Okay. I'll move the A1 amendment to Senate File 4508. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Senate File uh, 4508 is amended with the A1 amendment. Senator Rarick, to your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Members, Senate File 4508 is a bill to address some concerns that we have um, that at the University of Minnesota. We've been dealing with this in the Higher Education Committee. Um, many of you may know and many of you may have signed on to the letter uh, that we sent um, requesting that the University Board of Regents put together a commission to look at intercollegiate athletics. Um, during the pandemic, they uh, reduced uh, women's roster spots by 40 positions and they cut three men's uh, sports programs. And in talking with the advocates for these uh, programs, um, the stories that they told was that they were never engaged in the process and given an opportunity to help the university to be able to continue with the programs and not only continue with the programs, but to grow them in potentially other sports. And, and that is what these groups are looking for, is that opportunity to engage um, with the, the university and the Board of Regents. And we believe that this commission is the a process by which we can do that. And so what, what this bill is doing is requesting that the university would put together this commission. Um, we do understand we have no authority over the university and we cannot tell them what they can or cannot do. Um, be upfront, ultimately what I want this bill to turn into is going to be that if any new funding goes to the university, that uh, that funding would be tied and we would not allow MMB to make those appropriations until this commission is established. So ultimately, um, I don't know how detailed you want me to get on the commission itself, but uh, uh, what we said, the, the commission would look to explore the past, present and future of intercollegiate athletics at the University of Minnesota um, looking at the, in the past uh, the importance that it has played um, in the participation for intercollegiate athletics and the participants, uh, the history at the University of Minnesota and the evolution of varsity sports sponsorship um, to access current uh, situation within intercollegiate athletics and to make recommendations to sustain, to sustain its long-term vitality. Uh, to explore all reasonable financing models um, and help with budget reductions per sport, uh, rethinking scholarships and additional funding sources, and to propose ideas for repositioning Olympic sports so that they are, are aligned with the educational mission of the University of Minnesota. So those would be the key functions of this commission that the Board of Regents would be putting together and overseeing. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Uh, without question, I think we would all uh, support that goal and uh, 
especially in our time where uh, health is very important. Uh, sports provide a great outlet for mental, emotional, and physical strength. And so it's disappointing that the regions would have seen fit to have uh, discontinued um, this level of sports for our college kids. So thank you, Senator Rarick. I see no other questions at this time, but I believe we do have another amendment. And I will offer um, the, let's see, just a moment here. Senator Lang, I'll come to you shortly here. I just need to be sure we have things in order. It's Senator Lang's amendment. Madam Chair, um, copies are being made now and brought to us, but we do not have copies for the committee yet. Okay, we don't have copies yet. Um, are we able to uh, take Senator Lang brought his amendment and just make copies here? Sure. All right, we're gonna do that, Senator Lang, and try and uh, take care of this bill. Uh, Senator Lang, why don't you introduce your amendment and talk about uh, the purpose of introducing this amendment and the subject of the amendment while we get the actual language to everybody. Sure. Well, well thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members. This is a, a little uh, out of the ordinary as far as uh, probably procedure goes. But uh, the A22 amendment, so everybody remembers uh, just uh, about, about a month, a month and a half ago when the OLA report came out about the EMSRB the State Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board and some of the, uh, the let's just call it uh, uh, dark, <laughs> as it came out of the report, a little bit of uh, bad news and some, some uh, definite fixes needed to be taking place within the EMS board structure and, uh, and honestly a little bit of, of policy as we go forward. So what the A22 amendment does is it changes the, uh, the actual uh, uh, composure of the board, uh, reducing its size from 14 members down to eight. Uh, they are still appointed in the same method through the governor's office. Um, it just, uh, and, and then some of the composure, or excuse me, the, uh, the composition of the board would change as far as representation uh, to exclude any conflict of interest that have risen uh, in, in past, uh, over, uh, well, in, in the 20 some years the board has been in existence. So, uh, and I, I need to throw a little thank you out there to Representative Hewitt in the House for the work he's done on this. Uh, also to the, the state uh, medical uh, folks that have come out of the woodwork really when it comes to their regulatory board and trying to help, as well as the staff from the EMSRB itself have all come together to, to offer this amendment. So there's really two parts there. The eight uh, specific personnel that will be a part of the board, and then there's a term limit section on uh, page two, line 2.20. So uh, with, with that, Madam Chair, that is largely the, uh, the constitution of the A22 amendment. Thank you, Senator Lang. I believe the Office of the Legislative Auditor did a report. They did. And my understanding is that some of the changes we're seeing here our recommendations from the Office of the Legislative Auditor's report. Ms. Senator Lang. Th that's very correct, Madam Chair. There wasn't specifics that came out in the report yes. per se, uh, but this is, uh, I guess, regarded as the, the correct mm -hmm. path to take. Sure, Senator Lang. They don't dictate exactly. They just <laughs> right. say the structure should be this or should reflect that or so on, which is what you've then taken from it, but that's uh, the, one of the purposes for this. And um, uh, so members, any questions in regards to Senator Howe? Thank and then you, we're gonna go to Ms. James for uh, an amendment to the amendment shortly, but first I'll go to you, Senator Howe. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Lang, is there a reason why uh, we took out a physician that was involved in the EMS, med emergency medical services? Senator Lang. I'm, I don't know. On, on, line, on line 2.1. Yeah, 2.1. Uh, we removed a family practice physician who's currently involved in emergency medical services. Is was there it was that was there a reason for taking out the doc? Senator Lang. Uh, Senator Howen, uh, Madam Chair, the, the the answer to that question is just to reduce the size of the board. Uh, largely, there is still a, a medical practitioner. If you look online, uh, one is an emergency physician, and then there's also a hospital administrator as uh, the second member of the board that is usually, most 
cases uh, a medical doctor as well. So there are still uh, doctors that will be part of the MSRB. Uh, the, the Constitution largely is um, a variety of folks throughout the EMS uh, world that would comprise the board. So there's, there, we, we tried to make it um, have a viewpoint from all, all, all viewpoints, really, uh, in Thanks. all areas of the emergency medical services realm. So, okay. Thank you, Senator Lang. Okay, uh, Senator Howe, I mean, Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Lang, um, we, we, we had quite a few hearings in the Legislative Audit Commission in regards to the changes, and we heard from the, the existing board um, chair that it, it was too onerous, uh, onerous and burdensome based on the number of members. I'm not opposed to the, the members in the, in the reduction, but did this recommendation, I hope, came from that the chair, the chair and or the new executive director who appears to be... Um, uh, well aware of the challenges, and so I just want to confirm that they are in agreement with it. Thank you, Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the, Senator Lang. The, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> they, they were involved, uh, but ultimately they, they wouldn't be responsible for the, the outlier of this. This is um, largely myself and, and some uh, interest, interested uh, members of the, com you know, the community, really, uh, that the, the board size needed to be reduced, that really the, the meetings have been cumbersome. Um, and, and we really wanted to <laughs> update the efficiency and the effectiveness of the board is really what's happening, so. Thank you, Senator Lang. Senator Lang, uh, some members are having a little difficult time understanding you, so p be sure to lean into the microphone. Okay. They're tough in these hearing rooms, uh, the microphones at the testimony, where we most, really, <laughs> most importantly want to hear. But it'd be helpful if you do that. Senator Coran, any follow-up? Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Senator Claussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Lang, uh, have you had discussions with the House on this, and is there similar language in a House bill to what you're proposing? Senator Lang. Uh, actually, Senator Claussen, Madam Chair, the, uh, the conversation has been uh, pretty robust between ourselves and the House. It's uh, really been a, a team effort to try to uh, respond to the OLA report and have a, a product here that's that hopefully, uh, you know, the EMSRB board might not be, if you're on the board right now as part of a 14-member board and there's going to be eight members come next year, you might have a different opinion. But uh, really, it's, it's yeah, the, the House has been really good to work with, honestly. So, I, I, I don't know if he plans on offering this anytime soon. Uh, I haven't talked to Hewitt since a, a week or two ago, but um, I probably will today. <laughs> Senator Claussen? Thank you. So, uh, Representative Hugh had been involved in the discussions Correct. on this. Okay, Correct. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Senator Clausen. Uh, with that, members, I'm going to go to Ms. James. She has an oral amendment to the A22, and members, so that you know, the amendment has been posted and distributed to the committee. Madam, Ch Madam Chair and members, this, this amendment is actually drawn to another Senate file, so we need to make some changes to it so it fits with the... Uh, bill before you, Senate File 4508. So the changes we need to make are on line 1.1, delete 4198 and insert 4508. On line 2, delete 11 and insert 1 and delete 19 and insert 4. On uh, line 1.3, delete 8 and insert 1. And on page 2, line 15 of the amendment, delete 9 and insert 2. All right, members, on that oral, Ms. Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Because this is an oral amendment, could you repeat that, please? <laughs> Madam Chair and members, on line 1.1, 1 .1, delete 4198 and insert 4508. On line 1.2, delete 11 and insert 1 and delete 19 and insert four. On uh, line 1.3, delete eight and insert one. And on line 2.15 of the amendment, delete nine and insert two. Thank you, Ms. James. Okay, members, uh, on that oral amendment, I will incorporate 
that oral amendment into the A22. So members, now we're on the A22 amendment as amended. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, I'll renew my motion. All in favor of the A22 amendment to Senate File 4508, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The A22 as amended is adopted. So now, Senator Rarick, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Senator thank, Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just real quick, uh, you know, I'll say we'll probably be seeing this as an amendment uh, to the higher education bill, and I'm going to be working with Senator Claussen uh, on any little tweaks that may have to happen. But uh, ultimately, you know, we're working on getting this commission together to help uh, university sports uh, in the future uh, to be the best they can be. Thank you. And so, members, uh, to let you know, uh, this bill is going to go to Rules Committee. Pardon? Higher Ed. Okay. Um. All right. Uh, on the motion, uh, Senate File 4508, as amended, be recommended to pass and to be referred to Higher Education Committee. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails and is adopted. Senator Rarick, you, you are on your way. And members, to let you know, um, we are just working hard here to get all of our items done. And coming back from the Easter break, we are finding uh, Ms. James has really been challenged here on a very tight time frame and really, really appreciate all her hard work. Our next bill we're going to do is Senator Coleman's bill, Senate file 4045. She's unable to be here today, so we're going to have Senator Pratt uh, present the file, Senate file 4045. And Senator Pratt, as a member of the committee, go ahead and make your motions. Thank you, uh, Madam, Madam Chair. I, I move uh, Senate file 4045. Um, Senator Pratt, wait just a moment. Senator Pratt, we have um, it's just the amendment thing. We're waiting for them. Why don't you go ahead on Senate File 4045 then uh, when you're ready <laughs> and, and present the bill as it is, and we'll uh, wait for the amendments till the, it arrives. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and, and members. Um, Senate File uh, 4045, um, I'm pleased to be able to, to uh, present it on behalf of Senator Coleman, who's unable to be with us today, but she is the chief author. Uh, Senator Miller led passage of the Chloe Barnes Advisory Council on Rare Diseases in 2019 to be housed at the University of Minnesota. The council membership includes four legislative members, and Senator Coleman is the uh, uh, currently the Senate Republican Caucus representative. This legislation moves the Rare Disease Advisory Council from the University of Minnesota to the Minnesota Council on Disability, which better allows the council to actively work on public policy. Uh, the move aligns with the intent of the stakeholders who worked with Senator Miller in 2019, which was that the council would advise and state would advise the state and actively work on public policy to benefit the rare disease community. As far as I know, M Madam Chair, there is uh, no opposition. This is, it's been through three other committees uh, and there is no fiscal cost. Thank you very much, Senator Pratt. Uh, members, until the amendments arrive, we're just gonna go ahead and uh, take our testifiers next. Ms. Amy Gaviglio. Ms. Gaviglio, are you? I am here. Okay, Can you hear oh, me? wonderful. Hi there. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair and, and members of the committee. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about Minnesota's Rare Disease Advisory Council. Uh, my name is Amy Gaviglio. I am a genetic counselor and I am the chair of the executive subcommittee for the council. Um, before addressing the bill before you, I, I do want to take the opportunity to say thank you for the foresight and commitment in understanding the importance of having a council directed towards addressing the numerous needs and gaps in care amongst the Minnesota rare disease community. 
Um, as many of you may be already aware, rare diseases, while individually rare, are collectively common, with as many as 580,000 individuals in the state of Minnesota having a rare disease. Uh, so as was mentioned, as, as a result in 2019, numerous advocates and legislators realized how important it is for Minnesota to have a rare disease council that really allows us to examine the common challenges and barriers while advocating for and, and driving needed policies and changes to help ensure that all Minnesotans have the ability to reach their full potential. Um, some surveys that we conducted as a council really further emphasize the value of the initial intention of the council, uh, that the needs of the rare disease community are not only vast, but will only be met through robust advocacy and policy. Um, so gaps identified by the surveys include issues like telehealth and transition, um, with nearly 60% of respondents indicating the value of telehealth health act access in reducing the burden of care and 44% reporting problems with transition from pediatric to adult care. Um, these and, and other gaps identified are all issues that require policy engagement to reduce the disparities faced by this community. Um, unfortunately, despite many attempts under our current organization, we have really been unable to find a path forward that allows the Council to do these aspects of rare disease work to the extent needed and originally intended. Um, certainly, understandably, the University of Minnesota has their own policy initiatives, their own risk considerations, um, but this is hampering our ability to truly drive progress and represent rare diseases at a, at a state level. Um, so as a result, through a, a robust and transparent process, the council assessed four other potential organizations um, and through uh, two separate voting processes, uh, we have determined that the Minnesota Council on Disability is in better alignment with the work that the rare disease community needs us to do. Uh, the Minnesota Council on Disability has expressed their support of this move. They have indicated that the rare disease council would have the autonomy to advise and engage in policy work and we both feel that the synergy of our missions will be exceedingly beneficial. Um, so the bill before you provides language to this effect while also expanding on additional identified needs. Um, we do have Trevor Turner with the Minnesota Council on Disability here who is available if you have any questions for him. Um, but again, I'll, I'll end and say on behalf of the council, we, we very much thank the Minnesota legislature for their support of this work and community. And we are very eager to enhance our efforts for the 580,000 individuals and their caregivers in the state. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Gaviglio. I appreciate it. Just want to mention, uh, sometimes folks think they hear the, the title of our committee, State Government Committee. But this committee does provide several important functions, and especially um, in the structure of commissions and councils, and making sure that the goals and purposes by which a council or work group or all those kinds of things that are there are structured in such a way that they can accomplish their purpose. So we understand the intent uh, that you have stated well, Ms. Caviglio. Uh, but um, the purpose of this committee is to make sure that it is structured for success so that the goals and intentions that you have in mind um, are there, sometimes called the devils in the details uh, kind of work. And it is important, as you find out later on, if it is not structured in that way, then it hampers uh, your uh, success. And we want you to be successful in this rare disease council and any of them. So with that, I'm going to go to uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Trevor Turner, uh, Public Policy Director from the Minnesota Council on Disability, the next testifier. Welcome, Mr. Mm -hmm. Turner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I am not only the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability, um, I also have a rare disease myself. I have a Usher syndrome, which is, causes severe hearing loss and progressive blindness. So I know both personally and professionally the importance of having a rare disease advisory council. Um, we here at the Minnesota Council on Disability support this move. Uh, we welcome it and we would like to express our support for this bill. Um, there is a lot of overlap, if not a complete overlap between rare diseases and disability. Um, we believe that it's not just uh, when in the uh, experience of rare diseases, it's not just uh, the medical research or medical treatment, but it's also holistically an experience of having barriers in transportation, K through 12 education, 
um, human services and so on. And so we would like to be able to advocate and support the rare disease community and supporting policy decisions and working with our legislators and our um, executive office to uh, really push and support Minnesota with rare diseases. And so I am here to uh, support any questions that about Minnesota Council on Disability and also um, the, any kind of logistics with uh, moving the Rare Disease Advisory Council to the Minnesota Council on Disability. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner, I do have a question for you. And that is in regards to the independence of the Rare Disease Council. I know that in talking with um, folks in regards to this, the importance of their being able to be independent, uh, to have their own voice, uh, but receive administrative support and some location, uh, office location for them. Is this consistent with your understanding as well, Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, this is consistent exactly what we are hoping with the Rare Disease Advisory Council. They'd be 100% independent uh, to form policy um, decisions and, and advocate on policy that they feel that the Rare Disease Advisory or the Rare Disease Community needs, um, and we would support them um, in any way possible. Um, our own council, the Minnesota Council on Disability, would also um, vote to support any policies that the Rare Disease Advisory Council um, puts um, puts out for them. Um, this basically just logistically, um, just HR role. So our executive director would provide, you know, time cards and stuff for the director for the Rare Disease Advisory Council, but the director for the Rare Disease Advisory Council would report to the actual Rare Disease Advisory Council members. Thank you, Mr. Turner. I appreciate that and they greatly value that. But I also want to be sure that they, um, the strength of having an independent voice, if the Minnesota Council on Disability does not agree with some of the rare disease proposals, uh, the Council on Disability would have no authority to uh, object or disregard or so on. Is that correct, Mr. Turner? That is correct. Um, I would hope that that would never happen, but if there is an incident where we, our council does not agree with the decision that the Ready Advisory Council makes, then we would just simply um, not stay out of their way, right. basically. Right, has no authority to override the decisions yes. of the rare, rare disease. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Turner. I want to be sure that we had that understanding, you might say, on the record. And then also we've worked to make sure that the language and statute uh, fits with uh, that intention as well. So with that, I will offer the A2 amendment, and I'm gonna have Ms. James walk through and explain. Some of it is technical, some is clean up, and other is structural, and so she'll walk it through. Thank you, Ms. James. Madam Chair and members, uh, on, I'm going to refer to the, the lines on the amendment and explain what they do. Uh, lines 1.2 to 1.4 um, clarify the relationship between the uh, Minnesota Rare Disease Advisory Council and the Council on Disability to say instead of that the Council on Disability houses the Advisory Council, rather they will provide meeting and office space and administrative support to the Council, um, but that they do not have authority over the work of the Council. Um, then line 1.5 of the amendment provides for um, it, it makes a change related to the appointment of the initial members. This goes along with a later uh, new section of the bill that establishes how the initial members um, are uh, selected. Line 1.6 of the amendment is technical. Line 1.7 of the amendment changes uh, the statutory site for the appointment process. Lines 1.8 to 1.9 provides that legislative members serve until their successors are appointed. Line 1.10 uh, eliminates an unnecessary notwithstanding of line of section 15.059 since it's no longer cited. Lines 1.11 to 1.12 eliminate a necessary setup of the staggering of initial members and it's not necessary because it's included in the new section of that starts on line 1.23 of the amendment. Line 1.13 puts a limit on the number of terms that members may um, serve. Line 1.14 to 1.15 provides for the 
removal of members by the appointing authority in the typical manner. Uh, line 1.16 to 1.18 provides that members, the public members serve without compensation but can have expenses reimbursed, reimbursed as provided by the typical council statute. Um, legislative members may receive per diem according to the rules of their respective bodies. Lines 1.19 through 1.21 provide that legislative members are not allowed to deliberate and vote on the decisions related to the grant of state money um, to avoid constitutional issues with a delegation of legislative authority. Um, line 1.22 to the end sets up the initial membership and the first meeting for the new council. It provides that the existing members of the university's council are automatically members of the new council. Um, and it sets up how their terms will be arranged, provides for the governor to set the, set the, the terms of those initial members so that their terms are staggered going forward. Um, it also provides that the person who's serving currently as the chair of the executive subcommittee on the University of Minnesota's council will convene the first meeting of the advisory council by September 1st, 2022. Uh, thank you, Ms. James. Ms. James, I have a question about uh, line 1.2. Legislative members may not deliberate or vote on decisions related to the issuance of grants of state money. Could you explain that a little bit more? Madam Chair and members, uh, courts have held that subgroups of legislators are not allowed to make decisions about appropriations of state money. Um, and so because that's a new duty of the group, the new duty is in the bill on line, um, on line 4.21 to re receive funds and issue grants. Um, that was in, in conflict with having a subgroup of legislators on this group. And so this um, removes legislators from the decision-making related to grants of state money. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. James. Any other questions, members, about the A2 amendment? Okay. Seeing none, I'll move the A2 amendment to Senate File 4045. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails and is adopted. Okay. Senator Pratt. Some closing comments. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. As, as, uh, as we've talked about, this bill is amended. Uh, the legislation w is, um, allows the council to proactively meet the needs of the rare disease community and aligns the efforts with other organizations in the rare disease community and will enhance the opportunity for the council to have a more statewide focus. Uh, so, Madam Chair, I would like to move that Senate File uh, 4045 is amended, be recommended to pass, uh, and referred to the Committee on Rules and Administration. Okay. Thank you very much, Senator Pratt. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Pratt, thank you. thank you very much. And thank you, Senator Coleman. And we're excited to see that the intention of the Rare Diseases Council might have a little more, less frustration, a little more success uh, in the coming days. So we're grateful for that. Let's see here. Okay. The next item uh, on our agenda, is Senate File 3636, Senator Utke. Senator Coran, would you move the, uh, when after Senator Unke gets settled, if you would move the um, A4 amendment and make the motions for Senator Utke. Madam Chair, I'd like to move Senate File 3636. Senator Utke, welcome to the committee. Uh, go ahead and state your name and title. Uh, we do usually uh, put amendments before we go into the bill. Um, is this your, not your first committee hearing, correct? Uh, Yes, Madam Chair, this is actually, what, our third stop, so. Oh, um, glad to have you here. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Aki. Um, and that, we have the A4 amendment, and has it been posted and distributed? It has. Madam Chair, I'd like to move the A4 amendment, amendment to Senate File 3636. Okay. The A4 amendment is in front of you, members. 
Uh, since it's not a first uh, hearing or an author's amendment, Ms. James, would you explain the amendment? Madam Chair and members, line 1.2 of, of the amendment is technical clarifying. Line 1.3 of the amendment fills in a blank of, uh, for the fee. This is, the fee is for Filing. Um, a payment Filing. to the Secretary of State mm -hmm. um, at the time of making an application to be a se structured settlement purchase company. Um, lines 1.4 to 1.5 of the amendment um, similarly address the fees required to be paid to the Secretary of State for applications. Lines 1.6 to 1.7 set the effective date for um, Section 18 of the bill at January 1st, 2023. Um, lines 1.8 and 1.9. Um, clarify the effective date. Um, as a result of the change of the effective date for Section 18. And then line 1.11 of the amendment um, also changes the effective date for the, um, clarifies that this effective date that's set on page 16, line two, is for all of the sections except Section 18. Thank you very much, Ms. James. Mr. Erickson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just one clarification to the, um, the fee that is being collected by the Secretary of State would be deposited in the general fund like other fees collected. There's no appropriations in the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Erickson, for important clarification. All right, um, Senator Utke, to your bill as amended. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, and I'll just give you a quick paragraph on what the bill is about and then we'll um, the reason we're here today, but uh, Senate File 3636 is our structured settlement bill. A structured settlement is an arrangement for periodic payments. Structured settlement payment rights may be sold, and that process is called a transfer. Senate File 3636 modifies our current statutes addressing the transfer of structured settlement payment rights. Uh, this microphone is kind of bouncing all over the place, but this uh, bill includes the current NCOIL Model Act language, plus language recently passed in, into law in Georgia, Louisiana, and Nevada, and with more states looking at the same type of uh, language that we have before us here today. Um, this, our original bill had the registration and the uh, surety bonds, et cetera, communicating and going through the Department of Commerce. Um, and we are here today because through this process in Minnesota, the Secretary of State's office registers our businesses and processes most of these things. So um, today um, we are here because the, the, we'll register with the Secretary of State's office where, and they must provide a surety a security device in a form of a satisfactory, or that is satisfactory to the Secretary of State. This security can be a surety bond payable to the state, a letter of credit, or cash bond in the amount of $50,000. All of these communications, the registration and the security part, would now be before the Secretary of State's office. And even going back to uh, when I mentioned the three states that have previously passed this legislation, it isn't unanimous on what they do. Two of them use the Secretary of State's office. One did use their Department of Commerce yet. So we can go both ways. Just in Minnesota, this is, seems to be the best route, and the Secretary of State's office has agreed with us on that. And uh, Madam Chair, I do have a couple testifiers here. If you would like to dig into a little bit more of this with the Secretary of State's office and uh, their response to it. Thank you, Senator Atke. Uh, we generally in this committee work with the structure of the, and the issues that are in front of us right now have to do with the Secretary of State, not the policy kinds of things that are also within your bill, though we do care about them. 
but our priority purpose is to deal with that. So I'd like to go to, um, I understand that uh, we have Ms. Freeman here from the Secretary of State Office, and I want to be sure uh, that they have the opportunity to testify in regards to uh, this. Ms. Freeman. That is correct. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Freeman. Your name and title for the rec audio record and then present your testimony. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Nicole Freeman, uh, Office of Secretary of State. There we go. Um, uh, today uh, we are here, um, we've been in communication with the bill author um, and other folks working on this bill uh, for a number of weeks and our I uh, feel like we're in a good place uh, to be able to accept these registrations. Um, our responsibility for uh, these registrations is uh, similar to other business filings in that we're just collecting the paperwork and taking those filings. Sorry, I'm trying, I'm trying to sit close. There we go. Uh, and so uh, our, like, like I said, we're really um, continuing that uh, uh, role as uh, the filing cabinet and um, public entity to collect that paperwork and keep it on file um, for these structured settlement companies. Um, and I think would work closely with the colleagues in Georgia and Louisiana just to hear about their experiences um, in taking these filings as well. So Ms. Freeman, this involves a new filing type for the Secretary of State Office. Um, in looking through this, I do not see any appropriation or additional appropriation for this work. Sure. So we just received a fiscal note request, I think, on Monday, and so we're working on that right now. Um, we do anticipate that there will be some amount of programming costs to create this filing and, and create, a, create a structure for it to be um, held, uh, and so, uh, but I don't have that right now. We haven't... Yeah, we, like I said, we just got it on Monday, so we're still working to complete that. All right, thank you, Ms. Freeman. Um, I know the Secretary of State's office does business types of filings, a variety of them, so yeah. I think it is a logical place that has a lot of uh, built-in staff who understand filings and things. So, um, Senator Atke, then we will deal with the finances in the Finance Committee. Is that my understanding? Uh, that is correct, Madam Chair, because that will be the next stop is the Finance Committee, and then we can add that last piece. Yeah, so, Ms. Freeman, we're going to need that fiscal note here um, soon. I would have preferred to have had it here for this committee as a Finance Committee, but um, I think in this situation and at this time of year, uh, we can have this bill go ahead and go to Finance Committee. I serve on that committee, yep. so I'll be able to follow it through. Uh, and be there as well, and I think that'll be helpful. Um, let's see. I think we've covered everything. Members, questions, Senator Carlson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on the amendment, um, I one thing that brought uh, something to mind. It says that the effectivity is January first, twenty twenty-three, and I think what the the prompting of this bill was to make sure that we had some protections for people that are in the situation of having a structured settlement and, or getting um, approached for a structured settlement. And I'm wondering why we uh, have that have it so far away, and is there something that's protecting people in the, in the, uh, in the interim here? Uh, and I, I, what I don't want, and I really support this bill, and I think it's a good idea, and, but I'm wondering what's, what's the reason for having it, uh, the effectivity out so far? And one of the reasons why I'm sensitive to that is uh, this weekend, I actually saw advertisements on television for uh, people who have settlements, and it was a, a consultant for structured settlements. And I'm wondering if we're dealing with some ambulance chasers here now, where there's structured settlements and there's uh, gonna be a, a business between now and when the effectivity takes place, and uh, you know, to try to get people to sign up for something that uh, may damage their future. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Senator Utke? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Carlson. And I think part of it is, as we go through this, there are some different effective dates in the different sections. Uh, I flipped open on page 15 as an example, and there's August 1st of 2022. 
Some of these have a little later start because of the time it takes to implement the programming or just to get everything totally set up. But, you know, it's basically as soon as possible, but it has to be realistic. So those, that's why the dates are in there that we're working with currently. Madam Chair, thank you for the clarification, Senator. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Any other members? Okay, seeing none, uh, Senator Utke, a closing comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just thank you and the committee members for hearing this uh, step in the life of this bill, and I appreciate uh, your interactions here today, and uh, I look forward to the next step of seeing you again at Finance. I I've thought of this before, Senator Utke, as I also saw those advertisements and such, and I didn't know whether there was or wasn't just uh, kind of followed up. So I think this is important, uh, consumer protection uh, kind of issue. And so um, uh, I think that is good. So with that, members, we're first going to vote on the amendment, uh, the A4 amendment uh, to Senate file 3636. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Uh, and then Senator Utke, we're going to go ahead and move your bill. We're going to move it to Finance, Finance Committee, okay? Uh, Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that Senate File 3636, as amended, be recommended to pass and be, refer be referred to the Finance Committee. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Utke, you're on your way to finance. I will see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Utke. Okay, members, um, we, our last item on the agenda today is actually an update on something that we passed here in this committee last year, and it has to do with uh, reverse auction for the state employees' uh, pharmaceutical benefit. And uh, we're gonna get an update today from Minnesota Management and Budget in regards to that. And members, uh, you have in your, your packet today a slide presentation to go along with, MMB sent this over. We also have a letter from the interfaculty organization from the PBM Accountability Project. Uh, there's also the joint labor relations um, as well. So I think we have some uh, good things in your packet uh, for you to take a look at. I think with that, we're gonna go ahead now to uh, Ms. Smith from MMB to go ahead and give us an update. Thank you very much for being here and state your name and so on for the audio record. Good morning, Chair Kiffmeyer and members. My name is Lorna Smith. I'm the Director of Employee Insurance at Minnesota Management and Budget. And thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm, like you said, gonna get a brief update of the project and um, it's going well. Uh, we're on time and um, We've got a happy crew, I think, working on it. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen here and have... It's coming, Ms. Smith. There it is. Hopefully you're seeing my PowerPoint. Okay, we can good. see it here, it's displaying. Thank you so much. Okay. So just first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Um, CIGIP uses a PBM to administer their prescription drug benefit program that we provide state employees, retirees, and their eligible dependents. We first added a PBM to the program about 15 years ago um, based on an, arrange, an agreement between um, the management and unions. All of our PBMs have been selected through request for proposal or RFP that was scored by both management and union representatives. We currently contract with CVS Caremark to serve as our PBM. That contract is gonna expire on December 31st of this year. And we are in the process of selecting a vendor for a new five-year contract. So last session, um, you folks added a new provision to statute that requires SIGIP to contract with the PBM and to procure those services through um, the aid of a platform vendor. The platform vendor is required to conduct the reverse auction to select the PBM, and then once the contract is in place, to conduct certain ongoing services to ensure the state receives what it's owed under the PBM contract. 
The statute lays out a process to be followed that procures both vendors and the specific requirements that each vendor must meet. So the first step under the statute was to contract with a PBM platform vendor. We issued an RFP this past summer. We had two responders and um, through a committee of management and union representatives, we selected a company called Traveris. Traveris is an industry leader in this field. We're confident that they met all the statutory requirements and that they have the right staff experience in technology to successfully conduct the reverse auction, provide those ongoing services. We entered into contract with Traveris this past October. So the next step is to select the PBM. And we are now nearly 65% of the way through that selection process. An RFP was issued in late January, and that was published in the state register. And the RFP is conducted entirely through the Traveris platform. To develop the platform, Traveris first loaded their platform with our current plan and other data related to our program. This data serves as the status quo by which all of the responses are being measured. After that was done, both MMB and the unions worked with the Tavares to develop the RFP that we're using to solicit the PBM responses. That RFP consists of a questionnaire, contract terms, and financials. The financials are a detailed list of items such as dispensing fees, average wholesale price discounts, and financial guarantees. For each of these items, responders enter a specific price that is measured to the status quo. The terms are statements that responders either agree to or explain why they disagree. And these include such areas as claims processing, network specialty management, and a host of other areas that comprise PBM services. The state and the unions also include some custom terms that ensure the selected PBM will meet the needs specific to the state's programs. So these are items such as the vendor will meet the state's con standard contract term and they're gonna to agree to electronically connect with our health plans. Finally, the questionnaire that we used is a list of questions that MMB normally asks in its RFPs. These include topics such as the vendor's experience, the stability of the company and how they ensure member privacy. One very important part of the RFP is to understand the disruption to members that would be caused by the selection of a responder compared to the status quo. So this compares the networks, what pharmacies are in the current network, but not in the responders. It compares the formularies, what drugs are not on the responders list that are in the current formulary or that are available, but at a higher cost. The opposite is all considered. What improvements would be made to the network and formulary if we respected a certain responder. All of these items are very important because this disruption is what causes the most pain for members as we go through a PBM change. So the RFP was published in the state register on January 31st. As many as 12 PBMs expressed, expressed interest and six submitted a response. So the response to the reverse auction is, is being conducted through three bid phases and the unions are involved in each phase. We've completed the first phase. It ended on March 16th. During that round, responders accepted or rejected the terms, completed the questionnaire and made their first financial bid. Phase two ends on April 29th. During this phase, we're working with the bidders on reconsideration of terms. Responders were informed of their financial ranking compared to the other bidders and now they have the opportunity to improve their bids. Phase three is gonna end on May 31st. And again, bidders will be informed of their financial ranking and will have the opportunity to improve their bids. We will have an identified winner and an UBM contract by approximately June 30th of this year. So once a PBM contract is signed, then both Traveris and the selected PBM will begin their preparations for the nurse new contract that will begin on January 1st of 2023. The PBM of course will provide the formulary, the networks, clinical programs and claims management and Traveris will conduct claim by claim invoice reviews and adjudication. 
They'll do annual market checks and other functions to ensure the state's receiving everything that was agreed to under the new PBM contract. So that members is the end of my presentation, but I'm certainly available here for questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith. Uh, we do have some questions. If you will mind, we do have the paper uh, presentation in front of us. So why don't you go ahead and take it down so we can see you, um, you. on screen as we look at the testimony table. That's always very helpful. Uh, there were a couple things that I wanted to clarify. On the uh, page four of the slide, the contract was signed in October of 22. Uh, th October of 22. Question I have is, do you mean October of 21, possibly? Because I don't think we're at 22 yet, in October. <laughs> Just a little thing. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I've never just... caught that as many times I've looked at it. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're we eager to get the... it done, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we signed the platform contract in October okay. of 21. I'm sorry about that. I know we worked on some of these things, and I'm noting that it was three months before the PBM RFP was issued. It seems as though that was sufficient time. It was one of the structural things that we worked on. Seems to have, that yes. part of it seems to have worked out well, Ms. Smith? Yes. Okay. And then the other one is that we're getting six PBMs responding to the RFP. There was a concern that we, you know, would we get people uh, bidding on this? And we've gotten six PBMs. I would say that's a goodly amount for what we had hoped for, at least two, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, th I think our concern was the number of platform vendors that would respond. Um, six PBMs is, I think, the same exact that we had the last time we did an RFP for a PBM. Okay. At any um, rate, we're getting responses, whether it's a platform or the actual PBM. Yep. Right. I just wanted to say, though, that uh, when we go into this process in New Jersey, they had an issue when some term was changed after the process, right? And so they ended up in a court case and having to redo it. And this was a substantive um, type situation. So our understanding is that when we do this, that there would be no uh, changes or substantive changes. There might be a slight technical thing. So could you comment in regards to that and your understanding of that for the state of Minnesota to avoid what New Jersey went through? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, we are very mindful of that. Um, one of the things I talked about was the terms, and the terms are a large portion of the contract. And that's something we're watching and working on very hard um, during this process to ensure we have complete agreement on the terms and they're what we need. So do you have, a, do you have an actual procedure in place uh, that helps make sure that everybody within MMB does not enter into substantive negotiation of terms? Ms. Smith? Um, Chair Kiffmeyer, members, yes. Um, the, you know, the, the entire process is run through Traveris. And Traveris actually is the entity that speaks with the uh, PBMs. We don't contact with them directly. Okay. And you did a very nice job of laying out the timetable here. So. I think that accomplishes um, one of the concerns I had was, you know, these next steps and where we're going to be. And uh, members, I just want to give everybody an opportunity to um, ask any further questions. I have a couple more, but just wanted to give other members an opportunity. Okay. Uh, so my understanding, too, is the Joint Labor Management Committee, the JLM, has been engaged and involved with you in the steps of the process as was intended, Ms. Smith. Any issues with that or concerns? Chair Kiffmeyer, members, um, we have JLM members on all of our vendor RFPs, so there are absolutely no concerns with that. We um, want them involved in all of our vendor RFPs. Right. And I see some of my other questions here when you are um, going ahead here and um, that the contract is finalized by the end of June, and then all the different phases. I think the, I think the most exciting part, of course, is when you actually get started <laughs> doing this. Um, it's a lot of work. I appreciate that very much. 
And uh, we have a question from Senator Howe. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And going down that line of uh, where you were going with that, uh, I think one of the most important things that we look for is, is that open and transparent process and just exactly how does MMB plan to post the results of the reverse auction and the awarding of the PBM contract? When, is, when will that be announced and how will it will be posted and, and let known? Ms. Smith. Um, Chair Kiffmeyer, members. Um, I th once we have assigned executed contract to under state statute, then we can announce. And we generally contact all the responders to the RFP and let them know. And other than that, we don't generally do announcements. I mean, certainly we tell the unions and, and those involved in it. Um, well, I, I was, but, Madam Chair. Yeah, Senator Howe. Uh, so how will uh, those of us in the legislature that work through this process, how are we gonna know how this worked and, and uh, who gets the contract? Ms. Smith. Um, Chair Kiffmeyer, members, thank you. I'm sorry. I, I kind of trailed off in my answer. Generally, that's what we do, um, as I explained. But with what I've been doing with um, this process is I did send a letter to the chairs of state government um, and some other members when we contracted with the platform vendor. And we will do the same when the contract is entered with the PBM. Being that this is... Um, okay, thank you, you know, Ms. Smith. I legislated... And Ms. Smith, if you would also, uh, because we're gonna be out of session, so if you would apprise the, all the members of this committee individually, if possible, so that um, we've invested quite a bit of time in, in this area and looking forward to it being successful, but uh, hearing about the conclusion will be helpful. Ms. Smith, thank you. And then the other thing I want to make mention here, members, is that you have a letter from the Interfaculty Organization, which is the labor um, part of this um, and in statute. And so a very positive letter in regards to them that they have been included. They've had a voice in the process, active participation. And uh, so they feel it's operating smoothly. We don't often get these kinds of letters. So Ms. Smith, it's very nice to see. Uh, in writing here, commend you for your work in following and staying true to the statute. This has a big importance to the to uh, thousands and thousands of employees, and we want to make sure to avoid some of the pitfalls that some other states have. Even though it was a great success, they went through a few more um, pains, you might say, and so we're working hard to avoid that and be able to have it continue to go smoothly. Uh, if there are any issues, Ms. Smith, please feel free to inform this committee. Uh, we'll always be glad to be helpful to you as well. With that, members, um, I don't see any other questions or areas being brought up. And uh, thank you very much, Ms. Smith. I appreciate your presence today and the written update that you have provided to us as well as the other interested parties. Uh, members, um, we are towards the end of our committee process, and uh, we may have another possible hearing, but not likely, but it's kind of one of the nature of um, where we're at in a shortened session. Uh, but having concluded our business for today, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>